Hello there, and welcome back to The Disconnected. I am honored today to uh, finally have somebody from uh, one of literally like the biggest names in boutique Blu-rays right now, uh, James Flower from Aero Video. I mean, this has been a long time in the making, but thank you so, so much for doing this. Yeah, thank you, Ryan. I kind of uh, just for the people at home, uh, Ryan first contacted me about this about a year ago when uh, I was neck deep in producing the big Bruce Lee box set that came out last year, and so it was I wasn't able to do an interview then because I was too busy. But uh, I'm very I'm glad we were able to make it happen now. So yeah, thank you for inviting me, Ryan. Arrow is uh, I don't even know how to say enough about what Arrow has done over the last gosh I think we're going on really 15 years ish of uh, being yeah. a, a name in home video and the last six or seven years in particular have been a, a growth from you know smaller films and smaller print runs to major sellouts of major mainstream titles and uh, we're gonna get into a lot of that but I mean, first, I, I really think we should get into James. Uh, uh, what do you what do you do for Aero Video? Uh, so the principal part of my job, I guess, is to be a disc producer. So, uh, which in itself encompasses a lot of responsibility. So, my uh, when Arrow acquires a film, it's then assigned to one of a team of producers, uh, and our job from that point is then to essentially kind of conceptualize the whole thing from um, start to finish. So that includes uh, everything from what the artwork is going to be, what the packaging format is going to be like, kind of in, in, in consultation with other departments like sales and marketing, uh, what versions of the film are going to be there, if uh, and uh, you know just doing the research and figuring out what bonus features maybe have been on other releases we can pull over what opportunity yeah. there is for new bonus features and choosing who uh, and commissioning those as well so and just essentially kind of seeing the whole thing through from uh, beginning to end so right up to uh, authoring and QC uh, there's not a kind of part of the process that we don't kind of have our our hands on at some point or another and it's um it's a very <laughs> you have to wear a lot of hats and it's a very you know for, for a film geek it's an amazing job because it's just it's uh ticking so many boxes in terms of you know like i'm one of my main things i've always loved is sort of the presentation of films and yeah uh really getting into things like different cuts of the films and um you know i, I mean i've only been at arrow for I think about five and a half years, but I mean, before that, I was a fan of the brand from right when it started, and uh, other companies before that, whether it was Anchor Bay or Synapse or kind of back in the right. DVD era. So this is the kind of thing I've wanted to do for a very long time. So it's been a real privilege to be able to do it. Um, so that's the the principal part. But then otherwise, I kind of uh, play a slightly looser role in kind of working with other departments and representing the team of producers and uh, consulting on acquisitions and. And all that kind of stuff. So it's never, never a dull moment. Never, no day is the same. Uh, so, so to sum up, everything James does, pretty much everything at Arrow. <laughs> <laughs> um, with with what you you know have have brought to the table over the last five and a half years, a, a lot of people are going to wonder how how did you get there? Is there something that you studied to be able to get there? How did you get this skill set? Uh, I'm not really. I mean, no. No one person who uh, becomes a producer at Arrow has the same experience as someone else. It's kind of, right. uh, you know, uh, people have been kind of come from all sorts of different backgrounds from being uh, reviewers on websites to being, uh, you know, working in sort of different fields, publishing. Uh, it's, it, um, from my own part, it's kind of a kind of quite a kind of long and windy road where, uh, you know, I mean, I've always loved film and wanted to work in film and right from when DVD started, I loved DVDs. Um, it kind of started out, I thought I wanted to get into filmmaking. And then by the time I finished college, I kind of realized that really wasn't what I wanted to do. So, <laughs> uh, I kind of bummed around working at, in film festivals and stuff for a while. And then, uh, I did a master's degree here in the UK in film archiving which is a uh, it was it doesn't exist anymore sadly but it's kind of it's it was an amazing course to really uh change my mindset and start how i look at film so it's not just the films themselves in terms of uh their plots or their aesthetics or whatever else but it's also film as artifacts as you know uh pieces of 35 millimeter film or 16 millimeter film right. and uh the whole learning the whole chain of going from you know, negative to positive and all that stuff, which really completely changed um, 
the way I look at things and the way I work. And uh, from that, I then kind of moved to London and worked for a, uh, six and a half years for an independent film distributor called Soda Pictures, which uh, then was later called Thunderbird, which was mainly mainly contemporary art house stuff. But I also got to do some cool older stuff, uh, some box sets for uh, filmmakers like Jim Jarmusch and Kelly Reichardt. And uh, I produced a kind of big all singing, all dancing special edition of a, a kind of cult horror film called The Reflecting Skin. And that was my kind of arrow audition piece. Uh, and uh, eventually uh, Fran and the rest of the guys at Arrow noticed and, uh, you know, uh, there was a job that came up and uh, I got the job. And um, I mean, I, not to <laughs> divert too much, but like kind of at that point, sort of six years into working for this other company, I re- I so badly wanted to work somewhere like Arrow and didn't think it was ever going to happen. I thought you had to kind of know people and they didn't really seem to, you know, advertise. So right. I kind of thought, well, I'm going to start my own little label. So I, I even got to a point of registering a company and acquiring the rights to a film. I got acquired uh, Over the Edge, uh, sort of film from oh. like and uh, was ready to do it when, lo and behold, Arrow advertised the job. And so I kind of had the crossroads <laughs> moment of, well, do I go for it or do I try and make a success of this other thing? And uh, I went the Arrow route and I'm, I continue to be glad I did. Uh, Over the Edge came out through Arrow eventually, but yeah, it was a, um, it's been, a, you know, uh, occasionally tough, but mostly very rewarding five and a half right. years at Arrow. Man, I, I got to admit, for for somebody trying their own label, Over the Edge would have been an incredible first. Oh, title. I thought so. I kind of it was that thing of what's a movie that where the the HD master looks pretty good. Yeah, you need kind of work, and it hasn't come out anywhere before, and it's uh, I it could sustain me that you know all the hard work and all the risks and stuff. I could be like, okay, I, I need to at least put this one out. This would have been great, but yeah. But, well, and not to mention that's one that a lot of people were begging for for a oh, long yeah. time. Well. I, uh, I don't know if you've seen the the Arrow edition that eventually came oh, out. Yeah. But it, it was a labor of love, and you know, a lot of people came to it that way, and I was very proud of it all came together. Nice. Uh, so yeah, you've been there now for the last six and a half years or five and a half years. Lots of stuff has happened with Arrow over that time. Mm-hmm. Uh, Fran, who you mentioned, is now over with Radiance. Yeah. Uh, the Hut Group has stepped in with Arrow, and Arrow has exploded. I mean, there's, uh, you, you know, yeah. there there was some bigger box sets. The the Russ Meyer thing came on before you were out there. There was a couple bigger titles. But really, these last couple of years are the the mind numbing. Oh my gosh, how are they getting these releases? Type of titles from Arrow. Yeah. So it's it's a really good time to be attached to them. It sounds like it is. I mean, it's uh, the company's kind of continually adapted and changed in the you know relatively short time I've been there. I mean, uh, you know, when Arrow start, Arrow Video, I guess, started back in 2010, uh, it was just an offshoot of. Arrow Films, which was, uh, you know, a company that had been around for 20 years by that point. They were just kind of doing yeah. odd little bits and pieces here and there. And there wasn't really a kind of a, a boutique industry yet in the UK that hadn't happened. And so, uh, you know, it was, I think it was just a thing of one guy went to, a guy called Almar went to Alex Agran, who was the CEO of the company, and said, oh, you you know, you've got the rights to some good cult films like Dawn of the Dead and, uh, you know, some other bits and pieces. That, why don't you try and do a brand wait create a brand around them and uh shortly after that alex has made the very wise idea of bringing on board uh, a bright young thing called fran simeone who uh (laughs) who really is just i mean like fran's only a year older than me and i don't know how he's done so much in kind of the the, his (laughs) he's being a relatively young guy he's kind of he's just he's one of these people who has so much kind of uh, vision and kind of energy and so many ideas uh, that it's re- it's quite intimidating to be around sometimes. But he's he's one of the smartest guys. Knows so much about film, yeah. and he uh, deserves so much credit for bringing on board the right people and really uh, pushing forward. Uh, and growing Arrow as a brand, as a company, through things like uh, hiring people like James White and you and Kant, and uh, eventually many years later myself, and uh, really leading the charge with commissioning new restorations, which was something that was not commonplace at that point, Uh, and then eventually making the move to release in the US as well as the UK. So these are all things that have uh, accumulatively over time kind of led Arrow to be in the position that it now is. And, uh, you know, we were one of the first companies to do it. And so I think that has been a big help. I mean, in terms of the 
more recent changes over the last few years. So uh, Arrow, so Alex sold the company to uh, the Hut Group, and well, and well done for saying that, and not Zabby, by the way. That's a common. <laughs> And eventually other people have left as well. So uh, Kevin Lambert, who was sort of Franz number two for a, a long time, he's gone as well, as has Ewan Kant. He's gone to Vinegar Syndrome. Uh, it was kind of, the company had a little bit of an identity crisis for a while, which, you know, hopefully was not clear to you guys, the guys who are kind of <laughs> selling stuff and buying it. Hopefully this is all stuff that we could, you know, keep behind the scenes and, uh you know, make sure that it didn't really affect your guys' experience. But uh, it, there was a bit of, um, it was quite a turbulent period, just trying to figure out what Arrow was going to be without some of the people who had really driven the brand up to that point. Yeah. Um, and those people, they're not necessarily, uh, you know, they haven't cut ties completely. Like Fran uh, still, uh, you know, has done acquisitions for us on a freelance basis, and he's played a key role in a couple of, really big deals that uh you're gonna see stuff come out in the next year or so which is very exciting and and ewan is doing stuff for us as well on top wow. of his Venus syndrome work it's um uh, but yeah we, we've uh, after that kind of turbulent period we've uh managed to find a kind of new way of working we've brought some new key people on like uh Cliff McMillan, who uh, obviously co-founded Shout Factory and worked yes. there for a very long time and now he is at arrow and uh he's kicking butt he's doing some great deals for us and uh yeah it's it's i mean obviously there's been an evolution in terms of the kind of the types of films we put out and the amount of films we put out and um you know i think there's sometimes when you see people who kind of mourn the era that was five or even ten years ago i kind of I'm, I'm on the one hand i'm sort of sympathetic but on the other hand i'm like you know surely you must have been paying attention that this kind of it hasn't right. been for a very long time. And, you know, I think um, there's a lot to be excited about in the future in terms of our, you know, the, the kind of the, the output that you've, the things you've kind of talked about before with the, the some of the exciting big stuff that we've done, we're, we're building on that and we're, you know, doing going to do more in the US and more on UHD. And uh, we've got some big major studio deals coming up that uh, have, you know, given us access to things that we never, ever thought we would get, you know, in the same way that once upon a time, the idea of us doing Tremors or the Warriors or some of the other things that we've done in the last few years would have just <laughs> been exactly. That's a fantasy <laughs> release right there. So uh, we're all still kind of pinching ourselves that that came to light. So as we are, have any other stuff coming along but yeah it's uh uh like i say turbulent probably would be the word it's been stressful sometimes but i think we're you know we're in a good place now where there's some really exciting stuff coming up and yeah i can't wait for everyone to see it so this turbulent period uh this is something i was i was going to try to touch on ever so slightly and i'm glad you brought it up but there was there was a period for arrow where there was some disc replacement programs there oh. was uh, I'm not one of those people, but there's plenty on social media where every single month Arrow will post these announcements for some pretty good titles that a lot of people love, and yet 17 people will post on Facebook, nothing for me this month, where's the Arrow of this old? Guy. This yeah, is yeah, awful. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, 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 again, I, like you, I sort of sympathize with, you know, the, they were doing smaller titles and giving a whole bunch of love to things that people had never heard of and lifting those up, and that's great. But now, like, some of our favorite movies of all time can get that same amount of love, and the studios trust Arrow to do that. Why Why would we not celebrate that? Well, I, I think to touch on a couple of things that you brought up there. So, yes, there was a, a kind of rough period where there were quite a lot of uh, QC issues and dish replacement programs. And, and you know, uh, every now and then something big QC-wise does come up, like the issue that's just happened recently with one of the Coffin Joe films. There you go. Very prepared, Ryan. It's very good. I'm the, <laughs> I love the uh, visual aids there. I mean, in terms of QC, I mean, yeah. I mean, that's always, you know, again, this is something I don't want to sound too, like, defensive over because right, you know, right. it's always... Um, I, one thing I would say in our defense without wanting to sound too defensive is that I don't think we've ever made the same mistake twice. I think it's always been a thing where something really unexpected has come up that has really um, just is pro you know pretty much unforeseen and i mean the coffin joe thing for example you know uh for those who don't know the issue there was uh one of the films the subtitles stopped a third of the way through the film now 
we do see that film and the subtitles played all the way through. That's right. not, you know, that's not a case of we didn't watch it. It's um, something that happened, as I understand, during the actual the upload of the disc that then wasn't caught at the manufacturing stage. So that's just one of, like, it's a really bad luck and it makes us look bad. But I mean, it's one of the things where, you know, every, like every time something like this happens, we talk about it constantly and we, you know, institute new procedures and new ways to make sure it doesn't happen again. And then after a while, something else happens. And it's something that I, you know, I, again, I don't want to sound defensive and I was, but I also don't want to promise that there'll never be any issues again, because, you know, some it's right. inevitable in this business that, you know, there's going to be some, and particularly when you're doing what we do and kind of trying to pull together these really complicated products and trying to push what some of these discs can do, particularly with, UHD, which is a relatively new format, and we're still figuring out some of the bugs, some of the things that don't, you know, that still take us by surprise. I think that that is, uh, you know, every now and then it's something's going to happen. Hopefully it'll come to the point where it's happening less and less and less and less to the point where uh, it's, <laughs> it's not being anticipated and discussed quite as much because, I mean, certainly, you know, again, coming from a producer's point of view where, uh, you know, you are you work so hard on these things to try and make them, and this doubly goes for the the, the uh, Bruce Lee packaging drama, which I, I, I mean I am still angry about because I never got a a real decent explanation as to why and how that happened, and that's something right. that was the cause of you know I I worked harder on that thing than I worked on anything, and so it was a real bitter blow for that to happen, and uh, took a little while for me to get over, but. You know, it's um, uh, fortunate. I mean, fortunately, it, it it affected far from everyone. And although I, I absolutely sympathise with the people that it did affect, uh, fortunately, once they were able to get inside the box and see what was on the discs and have the kind of the rest of the experience that we'd mapped out, uh, they were, I think, by and large, very happy. So, um, you know, we are still, like I said, it's, that's the thing. We are, we are constantly, we're not complacent about these things. We're constantly uh, learning and studying and, and trying to figure out the, you know, like I said, the best way to make sure that this is something that happens less and less and less. Uh, and hopefully, <laughs> hopefully we're getting to that point now. I, I'm glad you explained part of it because one of the things I wanted to ask, which I sort of understood with some of the things that I've dealt with in my own life in the mm. past, but with the Hut Group acquisition, there were so many people, you know, making assumptions of they're going to tank Arrow, they're going to make them put out the the worst films out there, they're going to ruin the packaging. So, but yeah, I mean, it's it's it, you, as you say, we, we we've all seen it with other companies. So yeah, it, it's the the sound of it. It's just it's a bigger company that wants to make money. I mean, wh why would they not try to invest in something like that? No, and I mean that you know. On the one hand, yes, you are, you will see more of a skew in some ways towards uh, major studio deals, and there'll be, you know, there are some films coming up that uh, <laughs> when I heard about them, I was like, oh, really? That? But it's all part of uh, a kind of an eclectic patchwork of stuff that is very on brand and very along the lines of the stuff that we've always done. And, you know, yes, the Hut Group, they have, you know, targets that they want us to fill you know fulfill and uh but it is you know we're aware of that and you know it's all we're still also very passionate as are they about not diluting the brand and about you know uh giving the audience the same experience that they've always had and emphasizing the things that have always been important like technical excellence and uh you know the quality of our restorations and our extras yeah. and not kind of compromising on that experience. And so, yeah, when you, you know, yes, you, uh, I'm sure there will be people who will, you know, hear about some films that we've got coming up and be like, Oh, arrow of sold out or whatever. But <laughs> you know, that's, they, those guys always do that ignoring, yeah. you know, five or six other things that are along the lines of what we've always done. So, I mean, it's not, you know, I kind of, we tend to just ignore them and just kind of get on with our jobs. Cause I mean, really, uh, you know, the ultimate, uh, and not wanting to sound too corporate and measuring about it, really the ultimate arbiter of kind of whether we've succeeded in these things or not is whether they sell and exactly. And business is good. So, so either, you know, these people are, uh, bitching, but still buying it in which case, whatever, or they're bitching and they're not buying it, but they're still, we're still doing very well in which case who cares? I mean, it's, uh, exactly. And you know, the, the thing I would say to that as well is, uh, 
you know, there's so many more companies now. But, you know, it's a very crowded field compared to even where it was when I started. And so right. if, you, uh, if you don't like that we're not doing some of the same films that we used to do, well, you know, Vinegar Syndrome is doing those now. Radiance is doing those now. It's 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 not, uh, we're far from, we don't have to release all the films. Right. Uh, and I guess it's kind of a backhanded compliment in a way that, uh, you know, they the, the kind of people that criticize some of our choices of acquisition are kind of they're doing so because they know that we would do them really well and they just want yes. us to but you know it's uh we can only kind of do what's available to us and what kind of works for us as acquisitions and within that scope we will still you know approach it with the same care and detail that we always have done so and uh you know the audience is growing as well it's kind of right. amazing to hear people who are only just now getting into the physical media game, whether it's partly off the back of like the things that Christopher Nolan has said, which obviously has launched a thousand think pieces, which has been great for us, but, uh, <laughs> and kind of very validating, but yeah, it's, right. um, it's kind of amazing to, you know, I, the last couple of years I went to, um, Texas Frightmare and kind of manned the booth with uh, a couple of the other people from the RA team. And that was extraordinary kind of going thousands of miles away and meeting people who love our work. And right. again, some people who have come to it pretty recently and people, you yeah. know, because we've been around for a long time, you kind of figure that uh, our fans have been around with the whole journey, but that's definitely not the case. We, we're picking, you know, if we're losing people, we're also picking up some along the way as well. So it's, you know, adapt or die, I guess that's the kind of the main thing, isn't it? And potentially picking up more. I mean, the way that things have grown since, uh, I mean, this is kind of one of the, the good things that came out of the pandemic, but a lot of mm. people being stuck at home seem to ramp up the the physical media buying. And that oh, has yeah. led to some of these incredible releases that likely never would have been thought possible. I mean, we're, we're getting, we're getting great boutique releases of literally some of the best films in history, like the warriors that I just showed, or, I mean, even this, like we were told for years, this was not possible. And yet arrow delivered something that is, uh, you know, once we get the, the subtitles on one disc, an incredible package of some of the, the most sought after cult films of all time in HD. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, and that stuff is very exciting for us to do. And, you know, I, Again, it's like us being bought by THG does not preclude us from putting out a coffin Joe or something like that. It's, you know, but it also allows us the resources to go after the Warriors and Conan and some of the other biggies that, again, would have just been off the table not even that long ago. Exactly. Uh, so on, on that note, and to, to really <laughs> heap praise at your feet for a minute, uh, 2023 seemed like a... Uh, uh, not even just a return to form, but like a leapfrog over where Arrow ever could have possibly been in the past. And there was something about yeah. this last year that was special. It was tangibly different for Arrow. And the the releases seemed to be higher quality. The the film choices were remarkable and shining a light on things like Coffin Joe getting announced or uh, even films that a lot of people knew, but so many people in this generation had never seen like Barbarella. Like this is an incredible release. This is a, a magnificent release of a film that was not being talked about by most people. Um, did it feel different behind the scenes? Did 2023 feel like a special uh, sort of coming to terms with the, the new power of Aero Video? Yes, and no. I mean, the, uh, I say no. I mean, the, again, the, we had a kind of behind the scenes, things were quite kind of, like I said, turbulent and stressful with some people leaving and uh, yeah. having to carry on that work with, you know, while being kind of understaffed. So there were logistical challenges uh, and, you know, with trying to deliver a very ambitious slate kind of without necessarily uh, all the support that we needed. But uh, yeah, I mean, it was, you know, I think despite all of that, knowing that we had, you know, th this amazing Paramount deal with Barbarella and the Warriors coming up and, uh, Bruce Lee was a real kind of watershed moment in terms of, I, I kind of, for me, that one was, you know, uh, I knew that that was a sort of once in a career opportunity. So it was like, okay, if ever I'm going <laughs> to, uh, give 250% into a project and, you know, work evenings and weekends and do yeah. all of that stuff that I usually am uh, kind of strict about not doing, that's the one. Uh, and it paid off in spades and, uh, you know, yeah, it, it's just, it's, um, I think knowing that kind of Arrow has its place kind of in doing some of those big projects is, you know, 
it's certainly it's great to kind of work for a market leader, someone who kind of people look up to as a as a kind of company that uh, you know, and not to dismiss other companies who do extraordinary work as well, right, and right. all different levels of the industry. But yeah, it's uh, it's a real privilege to get to do that for sure. Well, with something like the Bruce Lee box, I, uh, I I imagine that it has to feel great seeing everybody responding and uh, literally saying, forget Criterion, which is the grandfather of all boutique labels. This is the box set to go to for anything Bruce Lee if you are a fan, because it is that good. How did that feel for something that you're putting all this work in? Because, man, this is... This is literally, I, I don't think people understand it just yet, but this is literally one of the best box sets in, in history. It's incredible. Well, thank you very much. I mean, yeah, it felt pretty good. <laughs> um, <laughs> I think, I mean, one of the things that came up um, when we acquired the films, and initially our ambitions for it were kind of much more modest. We thought, well, okay, we can do UHD, so let's essentially kind of do the Criterion set, but in UHD. Uh, this is right. before any of us you know, had done the research and kind of figured out sort of possibilities, what else we could do. Um, and it's really that process. I mean, that's where, um, cause I mean, that's my favorite part of really of all of this is when you're really, uh, hunkering down and figuring out the kind of the do's and don'ts and what people have screwed up and what they've done right and how to yeah. combine the best of all approaches and just, yeah, figuring out what this thing is and how to position it and what to do with it. Um, and you know, I had the criterion set already and, um, you know, I, at that point, um, you know, I, I wouldn't necessarily call myself a Bruce Lee fan. I'd seen a couple of the films, but I didn't typically know. So, uh, having to do like a deep dive and really get into it, uh, was really interesting. And that kind of threw up all these possibilities of what you could do, which, um, and some of the opportunities that, you know, criterion didn't take, which I think was partly mandated by the fact that they were producing it around the time the pandemic hit. So that restricted yeah. what they could do to some extent. Um, but, you know, we uh, were in a slightly more privileged position kind of further down the line of uh, being able to actually look at what they did and look what others have done and decide, you know what, we're, we're going to take a slightly different approach. We're kind of, because so many of the, of the extras that have been done previously weren't really to do with the films themselves. They were more about, Bruce Lee's life, of which the films are a relatively small part. Um, they only really were made in like the last three years of his life. So right. it's two years, really, last two years of his life before he died. Um, uh, look at me, I'm already forgetting everything. Like it's all, all the, <laughs> you, uh, you do these big projects and then all the knowledge falls out of you once yep. the thing's finished. But um, why we had a couple of, a few really big breaks there. One was that we were able to go back to the original negative scans and really kind of do those restorations from scratch and uh, do the work into figuring out what original versions looked like and, uh, you know, being able to present them that way, which Criterion hadn't been able to do by that point uh, when they did their box set. Um, and then a couple of really uh, amazing and completely unexpected uh, flute discoveries, which were the discovery of... Uh, what we call the Mandarin cut, the longer original theatrical yeah. version of the big boss, uh, which originally just came completely by chance. Um, we'd asked Fortune Star, who were the uh, licensor who hold the rights to Golden Harvest films um, for, you know, if they had like a tape source for just like Mandarin audio, because we just, we weren't happy with the source that we had. So we thought, okay, maybe there'll be something better on the tape. And they sent us a, a tape and it turned out to be a, a 25 year old telecine scan uh sd pal of the longer mandarin version and you know i uh i i sent it to because brandon bentley was already working with us at that point and i just i sent it to him going okay don't lose your shit <laughs> <laughs> I had to make like a, at that time brandon had been been working for us very long so i had to like create a, a screener with his name like plastered all over it right uh but yeah and uh, then we found out that not only that, but they actually had access to the original print that that tape was made from. So we were able to go back and get 4K scans of that. So that, that was one thing. We were already like pinching ourselves with that. But then we also, because um, one of the films we were restoring in 4K was uh, Game of Death. So the 1978 film 
directed by Robert Klaus that kind of used some, a little bit of the footage that Bruce Lee had shot in 1972 for Game of Death, but it's mostly its own thing. And we were restoring that in 4K and that was fine. And, you know, I knew that there were uh, alternate Asian versions of it with different footage. And so uh, we were working with La Maggio and Richavata, the, the lab in Rome that kind of, uh, along with their Hong Kong division, had done a bulk, the bulk of kind of the work on the masters that Criterion had done. And they'd scanned those negatives years ago. Um, and said, you know, do you have any uh, materials relating to these alternate Asian versions? And uh, they said, oh, no, I don't think so. We, we've got some dailies or something, but uh, no, I don't think so. And I swear, I did like a triple take looking at my computer. I was like, what? <laughs> it was like, can you please send us some MP4s of what those are, please? And they right. did. Literally, the first thing that came up was the log fight, which was just this uh, lost fight scene that had just been essentially a rumor that kind of, you know, up until last year, I'm sure most Bruce Lee fans would have sold their grandmas to be able to, you know, yep. get a glimpse of that. And so it was like, and, <laughs> like we uh, messaged Fortune Star and said, you know, can we use this? Can we put it in a documentary? And we're like, yeah, okay. Uh, and it's just, uh, so that then ultimately became uh, a sort of mammoth nearly four hour video essay called the final game of death that we where we presented all of the footage and with narration on top uh unfortunately read aloud by me because it was too late to get someone else to do it but uh narration nonetheless and brandon and i then also edited together uh, a new assembly of what the footage might look like if it had been completed in the early 70s as a short film for golden harvest and which was a an approach that had not been done before and uh it again that i i that thing nearly killed me, but uh, seeing the response was totally worth it. And, you know, it, it's by no means perfect. There are certainly flaws in it that are all testament to my inexperience when it comes to things like dubbing. And uh, But it's, you know, it nonetheless, it exists. And, you know, it's whereas, you know, I'm, I'm sure uh, if you gave fans the, the choice of uh, a flawed thing that exists and, uh, you know, it not having it all, I'm sure they take the flawed one. So uh, I'm glad that we were able to give that to them all the same. It is a uh, magnificent release flaws and all. Um, I, I understand that the rollout was painful for you. I'm sure to, to hear yeah. everybody's troubles, but man, it, when it finally got in the hands of everybody and the real, the, the passionate fans about Bruce Lee could go, hold on. This is, this is maybe the most special thing ever. It was kind of magical to see that wave of everybody getting it and realizing our lives kind of just changed by this. It was, uh, you know, it, it, I think it was a watershed moment for us, as you kind of said earlier, in terms of realizing, okay, this is sort of the... Um, and I guess the only thing I can compare it to, really, uh, would be uh, a few years ago when we did the the Gamera box set, this kind of... Uh, which, um, again, initially we had very modest plans for, but then uh, we brought... Uh, on this very bright young artist called Matt Frank, who just did these incredible artworks to go on it. And it just completely uh, galvanized us to kind of think of, okay, well, what else could we do with this? How big, how much more, what could we do with this and how big could we push it? And, you know, I think that it went from being, uh, like I said, a, a fairly modest release of what to most people outside of the the Tokusatsu fan community, it's just like a, a Godzilla ripoff or whatever. We we didn't think there would necessarily be that much demand to the point where we had completely underestimated demand and we'd sold out before the release date. It was it completely took us by surprise. But I think that's uh, you know indicative of um, an approach where you know I think people respond to effort and they respond to yeah. passion. So if you can bring that to the table and if you can imbue that in the product into the, what you're doing, it's not just uh, a re-release. It's not just, you know, slapping some fancy packaging on something on the same old product and not really, you know, paying attention to what you're doing. Otherwise, it's really giving people the opportunity to get on board with something special and kind of definitive, which is, you know, a, uh, I, I get it as a fan myself. I see it with, you know, some of the stuff I buy where it's just irresistible. Right. Uh, well, with that passion, uh, I would love to hear about in these last five and a half years, other than the Bruce Lee box, which we could oh. both just probably spend the next four hours discussing. Uh, sure. What, what have been some of the ones that you've worked on that have been, you know, for you that most 
I'm going to give it everything and put into this and make sure that the fans love this as a definitive release. Oh my goodness. Well, I mean, the, the first one, I, I remember my first day at Arrow, um, I was sat down and sort of told what projects had been assigned to me already. And uh, in the middle of this list was Robocop. And I was like, well, <laughs> well, wait a minute, Robocop? The original Robocop? Not the crappy remake, the original Robocop? Uh, and that was a real trial by fire in terms of it, it was um, my first real experience uh, working intensely with uh, studio approvals. So at that point, MGM were, and I think particularly given this was such a big key title, they, it's what they still regard now as a franchise title. Uh, this kind of thing now, nowadays, they don't actually allow companies like us to produce new bonus features for a title as big as, or a, what they call a franchise title, like a Robocop. Yeah. So we kind of got in in, a, in this kind of fortunate window where we were able to uh, to do it. But, um, you know, that thing became a full-time job in itself in terms of, uh, again, very big ambitions in terms of uh, the amount of new extras we wanted to do, the new, uh, having the two cuts. Um, yeah, it, 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 that was a real kind of statement of an intent for me, I guess, anyway, in terms of, the, okay, this is the, this is how the, the passion I'm going to bring to it. And this is, you know, uh, uh, proving myself within the company, I think. Right. That thing came out within my first year at the company. And I think I'd already kind of earned my keep by that point. <laughs> uh, so that one I'm, I'm still very proud of. And especially uh, when we did the UHD upgrade. Yes. A few years later that we were able to go back to the, uh, admittedly still very rough, but still original film elements for, uh, or the surviving film elements, I should say, for the unrated footage and upgrade that portion of the film for the uh, director's cut. Um, but yeah, uh, that's that was a big one. Gamera, as I just said, that was another one. Um, the Shore Scope box sets in terms of their size, I mean, um, that came about because, you know, I, I'd done Gamera and had a great time really researching and understanding and engaging with, uh, as I said, the, the Tokusatsu community, so the, the fandom that is very passionate and engaged with, uh, and very organized as well in their love of, uh, you know, Japanese special effects movies and monster movies. And um, they were so helpful to us, to me, to me when I was doing the camera set. And I thought, okay, I hopefully the, you know, when the possibility of doing the Shaw Brothers sets came around, uh, it was like, okay, I would like to see if uh, the Kung Fu, the Kung Fu fandom community is the same. And it's, it was different, but no less passionate. I mean, it's, it's, right. um, it's not quite as uh, organized in the same way that, you know, uh, I mean, the Tox Tokusatsu community have a Wikipedia that they update that was full of <laughs> stuff that I referenced every day. Whereas uh, really a lot of the Kung Fu stuff, uh, was a lot more outside of my comfort zone and needed a lot more research and understanding who the people were that were experts in this and also trying to innovate as well because um, Eureka and 88 had already done a lot of great work already in terms of bringing those films out in the UK and uh, working, you know, finding out people as well. But I didn't just want to copy what they did. I wanted to find people who hadn't had the opportunity to do commentaries or essays about these things and, uh, you know, with all of that kind of give a slightly different approach. And, you know, I think we succeeded on that in volume one and, uh, you know, volume two was a little bit more of a mix. And right now I'm uh, in the early stages of planning volume three, or we're in the early stages of production on that. So that's going to come out uh, towards the end of the year and uh, will hopefully be just as exciting as the first two. Um, yeah. Those ones are great. Like I said, over the edge in terms of being able to actually bring that as a passion yeah. over, that was really cool. Um, and you know, that, uh, like the documentary that Elijah Drenner produced for us on that, where he was able to get zoom interviews with pretty much all the surviving cast and crew. It felt like so many people, including right that up to Matt Dillon. I mean, um, <laughs> I was very, uh, very proud of how that came out. And so that was a real dream project. So, uh, I'm sure there are plenty of others I'm forgetting, uh, you know, but yeah, those, those ones will do as a good kind of representative sweep of what I've been fortunate to do in my time at Arrow. 
Uh, Elijah Drenner is uh, a masterwork. I, I don't know how he does some of the stuff that he does, but he is a, a brilliant documentarian behind the scenes. And I'm so glad that he's getting, uh, you know, he's he's more, I, I believe, full time with Vinegar Syndrome now. But yes, like that, getting syndrome. He, he's doing a last project for us now, which is an ongoing thing that has been on and off for uh, a few, <laughs> a couple of years now. Uh, which uh, will be coming out later this summer. But uh, yeah, he's as soon as that's finished, then unfortunately we won't be able to work with him anymore. But um, he's been yeah one of my favorite collaborations in my time with Arrow because uh, I was a fan of his already. I loved his Dick Miller documentary and yeah. the other stuff he's done. And uh, right away, it was very... Uh, I could tell that he was simpatico and he was someone that, you know, would have a really great working relationship with. So being able to work with him on Over the Edge, Robocop, and uh, the John Hughes films that we did and other stuff, it, it's, you know, he's been, it's been a very rewarding collaboration. Absolutely. And he seems to know everybody. That's the easiest thing. He's got he's hookups with everybody. <laughs> it's wild. It's, yeah, him and Heather Buckley and some of the other people that we do, they have very good uh, Rolodexes full of, you know. Uh, so <laughs> it's great. That, you know, that's what you really need. You need, and uh, especially on a project where you're not sure what to do to start with, where you, you, you don't really know what the thing should be. And you could just say to him or uh heather or jillian horvat or one of the other filmmakers we go with well who, who is a who do you think you could get what could this be and right. uh within a day they come back to you with some pictures and it's like great do that <laughs> makes your job easier i'm sure absolutely absolutely uh so uh speaking on some of these films i i would love to hear the background on some of like what inspired you to love film to begin with what what were some of the films when you were younger that uh, really sparked that creativity with you Oh wow! Well, I mean, <laughs> the first film I ever saw in a movie th in a movie theater at the uh, tender age of six was Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. So, uh, <laughs> Love the, it. Love one it. of the first things I ever saw in a movie screen was the Golden Harvest logo, which is a good kind of harbinger for everything that's come since. Uh, yeah, and that I mean, in that in particular, I really remember um, the. Um, there was a sort of TV report on the Jim Henson special effects and the animatronics. And that blew my mind in terms of thinking, Oh wow, there's a story behind the films themselves. There's a real, uh, that captivated me. And so I really became interested in special effects and how film worked. And, uh, I would just read books about films that, uh, I would not see for many, many years. And pro in some instances still haven't seen, but it's, you know, it's just that I know them through the books that I read. And uh, that just, I, it became a thing where I consumed as much as I could. And, you know, uh, my parents were still quite strict about what I watched in terms of horror movies, which uh, made me want to see them even more. And then after a certain point, when I was about 12 or 13, and they were like, eh, I'm sure it'd be fine. Uh, one of the real watershed films I saw was David Cronenberg's The Fly, which I saw when I was yeah. 13. And that movie just, uh, you know, horror film, horror films were something that was very uh, fun and but kind of reasonably superficial in terms of my appreciation of them. But then, you know, The Fly, I couldn't stop thinking about it for months. I, I you know, and I don't even know if that's in my top five Cronenbergs now, but it's still... <laughs> Uh, I love that movie still, and it's one of the most, you know, just uh, in terms of films that had an impact on me, that's certainly one right. of the hugest. Um, and I mean, yeah, I, I kind of, I really got into things like, you know, this being the late 90s, you know, American independent cinema was all the rage, and so I was catching up with, you know, all of those guys, and uh, including Robert Rodriguez, who we're working right now on, with right now on stuff, and it's, you know, um, from then on, yeah, it's 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 just been, like I said, a kind of a, a bit of a windy road where that's taken me through to production and then film festivals and archiving and other stuff. And uh, but yeah, I, I mean, it's kind of ironic that you know my favorite two genres to watch kind of in my spare time are horror films and westerns, which Arrow does no shortage of. But I've not gotten to do many of them. I, I've I, I think most of what I've done has been action films, really, which I mean, I'm not complaining. It's been, like I said, a real privilege, but kind of ironic as well. But um, yeah, I think, um, yeah, I, I, I think if I kind of had to trace so much of it back to that kind of that viewing of The Fly and when I was 13 and that being a very formative experience. The Fly and Ninja Turtles. What a what a wonderful yeah, exactly. one-two punch. <laughs> It'd be two, uh, I mean, there are two films I'd love to do, but yeah, they're just whether the rights are not available or whatever. Particularly, The Fly obviously is owned now by Disney, uh, which you know, uh, yeah. 
you know, it's it's one of those things that we hope that one day they'll see sense and kind of uh, open the doors to the Magic Kingdom and let us have at all these Fox titles that are being held to ransom, essentially. Uh, right. But yeah, not not today, not yet, unfortunately. You know, that brings up something interesting, and, and I'm just going to ask just because you're UK-based, so maybe this is way off base to ask mm-hmm. at all, but maybe you can shine a light on something that a lot of us in the community have been wondering. The UK gets a lot of really like over the top studio releases direct from them and nowhere else in the world do they do that other than the UK for like Warner brothers does it a lot. Like that big exorcist Bible edition they did last year. Do you know why it's only in the UK? Do you know why they're, it's like a proving ground of they can release those there and yet no one else can get them. (laughs) I don't know, to be honest. I think it's pub. I mean, if I had to guess, I guess it would just be a mix of, the UK physical market still being very strong. It's, um, you know, it's obviously in a, in a mainstream context, it's still declining year on year, which is, you know, the, the trend that you're seeing everywhere. Right. But uh, through the efforts of companies like Arrow and Second Sight and 88 and Eureka and at Radiance and all the rest of them, that's it's, you know, there's still a lot of excitement there. And, you know, it's a mix of studios working very closely with, uh, uh, chains like HMV, who fortunately are still around, that can then, you know, they want exclusives, and uh, it's still very lucrative here in the UK in a way that maybe it isn't quite. I don't know. I don't know the US side of the business as well enough, so I don't know to what degree Target or whatever or whatever the kind of. Uh, I know that we do a lot of work with uh, stuff with you know Best Buy and Barnes and Noble, and they've been. You know, obviously Best Buy, not so much now, but uh, Barnes & Noble certainly has been a great supporter of ours. And, you know, we, uh, but yeah, whether that just, there's not quite that connect kind of on the US, I, I don't really know, I'm afraid. I have a feeling there's just one or two people in charge of the UK division behind these studios and they just really love home video. And they're like, yeah, let's, let's put more into it. (laughs) Well, I think that is true anywhere. I think, I mean, particularly with, you know, when you're dealing with major studios, what you really need is a really strong advocate in the studio to kind of help make it happen. So that's certainly the case with companies like, you know, Warner brothers. I know that there's, you know, it's essentially one guy who I know has these great relationships with criterion and shout and, yeah. us as well now and you know there's uh it's the same I, I think you just need someone who can uh, you know break down doors and kind of make stuff happen because otherwise you just kind of get this sort of inertia that kind of because otherwise i don't know people are afraid of making decisions or something but you know that's true uh one one thing that i really wanted to hit on is with with you know we were just kind of touching on it with the the home video declining year over year just at least a little bit it it's this first time in a long time over this last year that i've finally felt uh like we might finally see a little bit of a rise in the next couple of years i felt more hopeful than i had been previously and that's not to you know say that i'm I, i'm ecstatic that streaming is going through some hard times or that the studios are losing money hand over fist behind disney plus and what so whatever but are, are you feeling like uh, there might see might be some optimism on our horizon? Uh, yeah, I mean, I hope so. I mean, it's it's uh, it's an unpredictable business, and I mean, you know, good luck trying to do a five year plan. You know, as, <laughs> as we've tried to, but it's all predicated on stuff that we have no control over, whether it's right. uh, you know manufacturing plants still being in business or. I, you know, in terms of obviously, we're throwing in our lot with major studios, quite not entirely, but quite a lot in the moment, and that's entirely predicated on studios just still wanting to be in business with companies like us. Because you know, it, all of a sudden, uh, whether it's because of a merger or just because they're understaffed or whatever, they might say no. You know, right. we um, we have worked with Sony in the UK. Uh, for a few years, but now the UK home entertainment division is essentially shut. So there's literally no one to license us films in the UK anymore for Sony. So we're still working with them in the U S but it's a different division in the UK. And so uh, you're not going to see Sony licenses in the UK in the future. And that's really sad. And I mean, that's, you hope that that's not going to be a trend and you hope that uh, 
libraries are going to, sorry, studios are going to see and, and the value of their libraries. I'm aware this conversation is very driven towards kind of major studios. And, you know, obviously we, it's totally fine. Yeah. We, we still work with uh, independents a lot and, you know, independent rights holders and companies around the world, not just in Hollywood, uh, who have been incredibly rich sources of, you know, mat- you know, films for us to put out. Um, but yeah, I think in terms of going forward, you know, we've, uh, I don't think you can kind of be complacent and say that any business, even ours, is recession-proof, but we've been very lucky. And we've, uh, you know, I think Arrow is certainly in a strong place in terms of having the resources and the contacts to be able to kind of survive some of those kind of headwinds and have, you know, backups, but um, and to kind of carry on doing it until it stops making sense. I don't know. But, I mean, uh, it's it's funny, you know, when I... When I first moved to London, kind of 12 years ago or something, I went to, there was a, a, a panel, there was a talk being held at the BFI called The Death of DVD? Question uh, mark That had like the BFI and uh, Second Run and someone from Eureka there. And, you know, this is even before I'd gotten into the business. And there was, you know, uh, they were already saying, well, you know, if we're lucky, we've got another like three to five years or something. And, <laughs> you know, like I say, it's about adapting or dying. And kind of, I think right. if, as long as you can adapt and f- innovate and find different ways of doing things, then uh, I think hopefully you'll be okay. But yeah, again, that is, there are things that uh, are beyond our control, such as uh, what major studios decide to do, whether the major studios even exist. Uh and you know manufacturing plants but i don't know i feel like uh hopefully because i mean a lot of us companies you know in the sector we're friends and we're you know we're i think there's obviously there's some competition but i think by and large we're all you know it's uh it's all that old cliche of you know the rising tide lifts all boats it's you know we're all invested in making the industry work and you know if, even if it came to the point of uh you know taking control of the manufacturing stage of things ourselves, you know, in the same way that Arrow has its own authoring house, you know, we've right. done that to kind of, you know, uh, directly have control over our output and what we do uh, to the point where even just now, just this week, I've been QCing our first in-house authored UHD, you know, that's something that wow. we're hoping to author more UHD so that, you know, we are not just uh, at the mercy of, uh, David McKenzie's schedule. God love him because he's very <laughs> in demand, and you know he's. Uh, uh, we want to do more than he is physically able to do. So uh, right. you know that's not something we've done lightly. We've done everything we can to make sure that we do it properly. And uh, Leroy, who's our guy doing it, is incredibly talented, and uh, his. I think he's done an excellent work with his first one, which hasn't been announced yet, but will be soon. And uh, yeah, I, I kind of I'm excited to, for people to see it and to you know, embrace it and hopefully be excited as we are. But yeah, in terms of the future, uh, yeah, I mean, (laughs) good luck making plans in this business, but, you know, we are certainly continuing as if we'll, you know, uh, things are going to be okay. And, you know, I think having those relationships and uh, those resources is key to that. Imagine when you first came on at Arrow, if you were making a five-year plan, how much would have went out the window because of what's happened? <laughs> I mean, I mean, a pandemic and people. I mean, it's, it's, right. there's all sorts of things that just wouldn't have UHD. Even we hadn't even started doing at that point. Right. I mean, I was so keen for Robocop to be our first UHD, but I mean, even back then, it wasn't really feasible. There were, you know, for whatever reason, we couldn't do it back then, and um, you know, we needed to wait. I guess we wanted to wait until we could do it right. And I mean, this is the, you know, I mean, we've learned a tremendous amount along the way and it's uh, uh, what we, we launched with Pitch Black and uh, Flash Gordon. And those were two great titles to launch with and we've you know not looked back since. And uh, I mean, UHD is one of these things that's really invig- reinvigorated the industry to the point where, you know, uh, our market share is very, uh, very UHD heavy. It's, it's, you know, if people have a choice between one or the other, they pick UHD like right. overwhelmingly so so you are going to see more titles on uhd more uhd upgrades more new stuff that is driven towards uhd and 4k and um you know as long as uh that people are telling us that's what they want that's what we're going to do 
I uh, I've loved a lot of the output on UHD. They they through Arrow, I can say that they for the most part look freaking amazing. Uh, they are mind blowing. Uh, but I I really want to put to bed something that's been a complaint about Arrow for a long time, and you already touched on it. Um, some of these titles that have come out on Blue Arrow has released on 4K a couple years later, and every conspiracy theorist out there will go. Arrow planned this all along. They just wanted to get your money on the Blu-ray and then charge you again for the 4K. And first of all, I always say you don't have to upgrade. They're not making you pay anything. <laughs> well, but that's true. But yeah. Is this? I mean, can you can you explain how that's probably not the plan to begin with? Uh, it's definitely not the plan at all. I mean, we, uh, you know, if we can do 4K from the start, that's what we're going to do because it that makes the most financial sense to do. Right. You know, uh, the idea of kind of doing a Blu-ray and then ripping people off of 4K later is just completely counterproductive because you would make a lot more money to start with if you just did a 4K. Um, in terms of, because obviously we were, um, so we started doing UHDs in, what was it? It was mid-2020. So, yep. uh, and from then on, I think, you know, obviously we've, we've upgraded stuff that came out before because, you know, we didn't have the opportunity to do UHD at that point. So, I mean, if we can right. do it, then why wouldn't we? If, if that, that's what the audience wants, then we want to give it to them in the best possible quality. I mean, um, you know, there are films coming up in the schedule that we released in 2019 that, you know, had just, you know, they just missed that cutoff point. And, you know, I think... I don't think we do it a couple of years later. I think we wait a few years more. But, uh, you know, I think... As you said, they don't have to buy it, and I think it's there. You know, we're all about choice, and if uh, giving people that choice. So, yeah, I think you know for our, our policy from now on is to if we're going to do 4K, we do it from the start. So, I don't think off the top of my head I can think of an example of anything since that uh, mid 2020 cutoff point where. Uh, you know, we've done a Blu-ray and then done a 4K later. Someone, I'm sure, will correct me, but I mean, that's that, that would be a freak occurrence because definitely our preference is to get it right the first time. And uh, for the most part, I would agree. It seems like the the choices being made they make sense. And some of the upgrades, like uh, you know, Twelve Monkeys comes to mind. It's a movie oh, sure. that it's going to do better. It's going to look much better on 4k and it, mm. it deserved that sort of an upgrade. Not to mention it's a big title. That's a yeah. well-known film. A lot of people are going to buy it. it. It makes, it makes total sense to do something like yeah. that. And I mean that, you know, we are, our restoration department is on fire. They're in a really strong, you know, it's a uh, two other guys called James, James white and James Piercy. So <laughs> the, the three of us together are a joke. It's uh, no, no one knows who's speaking. It's uh, but they, uh, they know so much about what they do and um it's just you know that's it's one of my favorite collaborations working with those guys and it's what, when you're talking about the discussing the ins and outs of restoring a bruce lee or a conan or something that's that's when you pinch yourself and say i get to do this for a job this is great <laughs> that's so true and, and i mean uh, you brought up conan i think twice already that set is selling like crazy i think it's already out of print from the distributor in the u.s uh i think so yeah it's uh, again it's um, we knew it would be big and uh hopefully again it is just uh one of these cases of people responding to the hard work that we put in because you know we knew that we wanted to make sure that we got it right in terms of everything from you know adding new extras and having the different versions of barbarian and fixing the sound mixes because they were both cursed in you know different respects and um you know we care very deeply about like i said trying to get it right and you know giving the definitive presentations and you know i'm sure there are uh ways you could kind of nitpick and that's fine you know people can kind of you know the people can have very valid opinions and that's okay but you know we uh yeah it was one that we really wanted to get right and it was you know a title that had been discussed on and off for years and we were told it wasn't going to be possible or it was off the table and until eventually finally it was and uh yeah we wanted to make the most of that opportunity and so to ha hear that people have enjoyed it as much as they have and is uh is very exciting you know that's uh doing things like the putting together the you know 
the Basil Polidorus isolated scores for the first one because that you know the music in it is absolutely insane and we wanted to highlight that and really showcase that and uh, yeah everyone came to it with the same passion and the same uh, love for the movie that we did and uh, yeah I'm really proud of how that came together. It's a remarkable looking release and uh, mine actually just came in. I don't have that one on hand. I'm not prepared. I'm sorry. Uh, We've got a fun uh, weekend ahead anyway. Yeah. Uh, So a couple more small things. Uh, One thing that I was always curious about, and I know that this is not going to be the same, so I'm just looking for an average if possible. Do you know the average print runs for some of these limited editions? Because we we always try to gauge how well the industry is doing with Arrow, because a lot of these, you know, the the Coffin Joe says, you know, it's, it's selling really well. We don't know what that means. We don't know how many are being printed. I don't know. <laughs> I, I, um, I only know some of them. I mean, I, I like something like um, Psycho, for example, which was uh, UK only, but that was UHD yeah. and Blu-ray. And I think there were 10,000 of those across like those. Wow. But I mean, uh, you know, that's it's we're always kind of looking at sort of the trends and how things are changing. Right. And I know that we've been maybe too bold in the past. And so I know that. Uh, you know, Sure Scope 3, for example, I know that we'll be pressing less of them than we did 1 and 2 because 1 and 2 maybe hung around a little longer than we were hoping that they would. But mm. uh, you know, are, are selling out still eventually. But um, I think that we were, you know, uh, and it's not necessarily about FOMO, which is kind of making sure that we're not being wasteful and that we're kind of just actually right. catering to demand. So. I think, um, you know, it's always a drag when these things sell out quickly and there are people who want it and can't get it. Um, That's, you know, uh, you know, it's again, that's something that's kind of beyond your control. But, um, you know, uh, hopefully what again, what's on the disc and what's left for the the standard version that comes out later is still, you know, good enough for to be some compensation when I I agree. uh, The all singing or dancing version isn't necessarily available or if you only come to it later on. Uh, so before I get to, you know, a final little thing that we'll, we'll, we'll talk about, uh, wish list title, uh, other than the fly or Ninja Turtles, something that you would love to produce for Arrow, no budget, uh, no studio off, off line. You can go to anybody. What is that one title that you go? I want to put everything I possibly could into this. Oh man. I mean, I'm sure there's tons, uh, uh, geez. Um, like, I mean, I have weird ideas in my head for things like a kind of, uh, an all singing or dancing version of creep show that has Stephen King books and comic books and all kinds of crap in it. Uh, and, you know, in terms of films that I'd love to work on, I mean, uh, you know, one of my favorite films is uh, William freaking sorcerer. And I'd love to uh, upgrade that to 4k and give that a, you know, a, again, a kind of big multi-disc yeah. treatment. Uh, and, uh, but yeah, I mean, I have kind of weird ideas that like, I mean, I've got like a, a, an idea for an awesome Wells box set that I'm taking to the company soon that it might not happen. It might be, <laughs> it might not be quite what anyone wants to do, but it's, you know, again, something that I think would work for a part of our audience. And, yeah. uh, you know, one of my big wish list ones that probably won't happen is a movie from the eighties called the wizard of speed and time, which is a, a kind of, a, a it's, Written, directed, and starring a stop motion animator called Mike Jitlov, who uh, is in working with the Academy Film Archive at the moment to preserve his films. So there's some hope that a preservation of that film will happen at some point, but it's uh, he's, I know, has been kind of distrustful of distributors in the past because he had bad experiences. But hopefully, you know. Our, I don't care even if it's us who do it. I, I want someone to do it. Someone need to right. do it just this. And, you know, hopefully someone can make him change his mind and, you know, that movie can come out at some point. But certainly, uh, but yes, the Fly and Ninja Turtles, they are two of my <laughs> big wishes ones for sure. <laughs> I, I know you probably can't say any specific things, but are there any teases that you could possibly give for the future for the audience? Uh, what can I say? Like I said, more UHDs. Uh, a couple of big major studio deals, including a studio that we've not really done very much with before, but that we've just done, we're doing, a, we've done a huge deal with, uh, and already I'm talking about another one. Uh, oh, geez. Uh, J horror, maybe some K horror. I don't know if that's going to happen, but hopefully, uh, short scope volume three. Uh, yeah, it, it, exciting stuff coming up. I am very excited, and if uh, the beginning of the year is any any way to gauge what the year is going to be like, I, we're we're in for a treat. I mean, the the Conan sets, the Coffin Joe box landing, uh, all of this is 
overwhelming. I, I mean, there's so many good things out there. It's impossible to, to stay abreast of, but Arrow seems to be on the forefront right now. And I, I just appreciate all your hard, hard work and taking the time to talk today. No, thank you very much. And, you know, uh, uh, thank you and the fans for all of your support. And, you know, as long as you guys uh, appreciate what we do and uh, are willing to buy what we do, we'll carry on putting our heart and, hearts and our souls into it. Perfect. Thank you, sir. Hopefully we can talk again soon. Thank you very much, Ryan. Take care. Thank you for watching The Disconnected. On the way out, make sure that you are subscribed to the channel, that you've liked the video, and that you've copied the link to be able to share with someone else that may appreciate this.